I am really honored and delighted to uh, present to you today Richard McNally on the topic of what is mental illness. And I'm sure everybody has a big question about this specific topic. And I also want to thank, before I introduce him, the president of UNE, James Herbert, who recommended him. And they're very, they're good friends. They go way back to the days of rebellion and mischief. And so, um, so Richard McNally received his BS in psychology from Wayne State University in 1976 and his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 1982. He did his clinical internship and postdoctoral fellowship at the Behavior Therapy Unit, Department of Psychiatry, Temple University School of Medicine. In 1984, he was appointed assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Health Sciences, the Chicago Medical School, where he established the Anxiety Disorders Clinic and directed the university's uh, counseling center. He moved to the Department of Psychology at Harvard University in 1991. And uh, he, used, he used to work very closely with uh, Jordan Peterson, I just learned today, where he's now professor and director of, uh, and, uh, of clinical training. He has more than 440 publications, most concerning anxiety disorders, example, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic disorder, phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, including the books Panic Disorder Critical Analysis, published in 94, Remembering Trauma, published by Harvard University Press in 2003, Remem uh, uh, What is Mental Illness, published in 2011. He has conducted laboratory studies concerning cognitive functioning in, ad in adults, reporting histories of childhood sexual abuse, including those reporting recovered memories of abuse. Among his current projects, a network analysis of psychopathology. He has been funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, and he served on the American Psychiatric Association's DSM, DSM, is it IV or is it four? Four, right, DSM for PTSD. That shows my lack of expertise in the field. And specific phobia committees, and was an, advi and, and was an advisor to the DSM-5 DSM anxiety disorder sub, sub work group. He is a licensed clinical psychologist, a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science and the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, winner of the 2005 Distinguished Scientist Award from the Society for the Science of Clinical Psychology, and the winner of the 2010 Outstanding Mentor Award from the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. He is on the Institute for Scientific Information's highly cited list of psychology and psychiatry, psychiatry top 0.5% of authors worldwide in terms of citation impact. So please help me welcome Richard McNally to the podium. Thank you very much, uh, Anwar, uh, for that nice introduction. And it's, it's great to be back here in Maine. I, I've never been to the university, been to Portland many times, including its wonderful art museum. And my wife and I try to spend a couple of weeks along the Maine coast, a little south of here in uh, Perkins Cove's, Cove area. First time I've been here in January, though, however. But it's certainly, <laughs> but it was, um, you don't spend too much time down there in January. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now I'm going to try my best. I've been instructed I need to speak into the mic, and, and, and I, I'm now chained to the podium here. Usually I try to wander around a lot while I'm speaking and pointing to the screen, which I can't even see, but I can see it here. I uh, try to get a few thousand steps in on my Fitbit, you know, <laughs> at the same time, you know. But uh, okay, I'll try my best. Okay, so um, uh, my topic is uh, what, what is mental illness? This is what, uh, whoops, what did I just, oh, there we go. Get this right here. This thing buzzed on me here. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, this was the uh, the book that Anwar had mentioned, and it asked me to uh, elaborate on some of the themes that are uh, in in there, and uh, just to give sort of an overview uh, about uh, some of the t topics I'm going to talk about here. Uh, uh, this issue about what is mental illness, what is the the boundary that distinguishes normal distress from uh, psychopathology. Uh, these topics have, uh, I, I think, broad interest. They're certainly discussed widely in the culture at large. And so I'm going to touch upon several of the different themes and controversies uh, concerning these issues and trying to render it as, as non-technical as I can uh, <clears throat> throughout. But to give sort of an overview, um, what, you know, what, one question is, are we over-diagnosing mental disorders today? Uh, um, there's been a lot of concern about that, and we'll, we'll see why in a moment. Um, how, how can we distinguish normal emotional distress from genuine uh, mental uh, disorders? This is like the boundary problem, you might call it. 
Um, then there's a whole other uh, theme that has risen mainly from our colleagues in other social sciences, mainly sociology who, and anthropology, that will occasionally say, you know, the, the, the mental disorders are unlike other medical conditions, that they're somehow socially constructed. <clears throat> so I'll t talk about that, that issue. <clears throat> And another one, uh, the, the uh, evolutionary biologists and evolutionary psychologists have had um, uh, a lot of thoughts about this matters as well. And, and some have pointed out a bit of a paradox, an evolutionary paradox, uh, insofar as genetic influences figure prominently in risk for mental disorders. And the question is, why haven't they been sort of selected, eliminated from the gene pool? Uh, there's an interesting potential solution to that that I'll touch upon. Um, <clears throat> finally, I'll talk about the, not finally, but uh, the, the uh, penultimate theme uh, is, um, uh, is there the, the harmful dysfunction analysis that was articulated by an interesting gentleman who's a philosopher of science and a clinician, a social worker in this case, cl a clinical social worker, who articulated the uh, harmful dysfunction analysis, a, a way that sort of he thought could be sort of we have a principled way of distinguishing mental disorders from other sorts of conditions. And finally, I'll finish up with a radically new approach to understanding mental disorders, uh, the network analytic approach or the causal systems approach perspective. I'll sort of finish up on that, uh, and I'll present just some, some data from our group on, on that as well. It's kind of like a, a huge topic in the field right now, but I don't want to deep go into the, to the technicalities of it, but at least show you how it differs from the other ways in which we've seen these things. Okay, so 50% uh, of Americans are mentally ill. That's true. Uh, or have been so at some point in their lives. Uh, and 25% uh, <clears throat> and of people have suffered from mental illness during the, the previous year. These, study, uh, th these studies came out from a, uh, a major epidemiological study done by Ron Kessler over at, uh, I'm, over, I'm pointing across the Charles River right now, I think I'm in Cambridge, over, in, over at the med school, Harvard Medical School, Ron's over there. And, <clears throat> and, uh, and so these, uh, these um, uh, findings really startled a lot of individuals because it seemed to suggest that there was an epidemic of madness in America. Paul McHugh, for example, Paul was a longtime chair of psychiatry down at uh, Johns Hopkins University, and he was quoted by uh, uh, the New York Times as saying, 50% of Americans mentally impaired? Are you kidding me? Pretty soon we'll have a syndrome for short, fat Irish guys with a Boston accent, and I'll be mentally ill. <laughs> That's Paul for you, you know. <laughs> he later said, I probably shouldn't have said that, but well, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> He's actually not that short. He's actually pretty fit for a guy. Not that fat, I mean. He's short. He's still short. He's still, but he's still an Irish guy with a Boston accent. Um, but actually, uh, Ron Kessler, the fellow who did the study, actually, he was simply playing by the rules. I mean, it was not that Ron, Ron was taking our standard nomenclature for diagnosing mental disorders, and this is, this is what he found. Well, but as he pointed out, as Ron pointed out in, in response to uh, you know, concerns raised by Paul McEwen, how can this be possible? Uh, <clears throat> is that many of the conditions that are formally a di diagnosed as mental disorders are, as, as Ron put it, psychiatric hangnails. Psychiatric hangnails. Things that are technically um, impairing, et cetera, et cetera, and causing trouble for the person, but, but they're not serious, often chronic conditions, paranoid schizophrenia and so forth, and some forms of depression that, that, are, that are really quite severe. So they're not all that severe, and so when you start thinking about this, that's not all that, uh, you know, uh, actually not all that unusual. So for example, had the New York Times said, this is a big banner head, you know, the New York Times front page above the fold, if they had said, 50% of Americans have, have had, a, had the common cold at some point in their life. You say, only 50%? Only 50% has had the flu or stuff? Right. So, 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 what, so the, the assumption that mental disorders are somehow extraordinarily rare was sort of part of the issue behind this uh, surprise and shock at these epidemiologic findings, showing that they're, they're not, when you think of the wide range of disorders, are not uh, all that uncommon. Okay, so, so when I say Ron was playing by the rules, I'm referring here to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders of the DSM. You can see why this is shortened. That's quite a mouthful. This is the, um, uh, the, the, the manual for how to go about diagnosing uh, mental disorders published by the American Psychiatric Association. Whoops, darn, I keep it in the wrong direction here. Okay. Uh, and, so, uh, and so some of the 
There we go. Uh, so some of the concerns about um, the epidemiological findings were that, okay, we understand that Kessler was playing by the rules, but are the rules screwed up? Right? Uh, are, is the diagnostic manuals uh, written so broadly that embraces more and more of everyday life? Uh, uh, people are not constantly happy. I mean, they have ups and downs and things of this sort. And so are we pathologizing more and more of everyday life? That was, that was, that was a question. You know, has the bailiwick of psychopathology, of psychiatry, clinical psychology, expanded too far? Uh, so in other words, this is, a, this is a critique of the rules themselves. And, and, and what, you know, one of the concerns here was how the, the manual for diagnosing mental disorders has expanded itself. So for example, the first, uh, the first manual, the first DSM, called, retrospectively called DSM-1, since we've had more than one now, published in 1952, there's 106 categories of mental disorders in there. You know, phobias, uh, uh, then called manic depressive illness, schizophrenia, and so forth. Um, by the time we get to 1968, the DSM-2, it had jumped up to 102, 182 disorders, 182, right? And then in 1980, in DSM-3, it jumped up to 265. And in 1994, we've got, uh, um, uh, excuse me, 1987, uh, 292, a revision of DSM-3, and then finally DSM-4, 365 disorders. You go, oh my God, what is going on? You've got this like obesity epidemic and the man is just getting huge, it's really fat, huge thing right now. And when you take a look at this, one question is, have we actually discovered new entities, new disease entities? Um, we're hearing about this coronavirus in, in, in China right now. These, these Apparently, I'd never heard of it before. I don't know when this was discovered. But be that as it may, conditions like that, or uh, new plants in botany, or new species in zoology, and new psychiatric disorders, or, or are we just sort of colonizing more and more of everyday life? Well, that's part of it, perhaps, but there's also, I should say, parenthetically, some of these are subtyping, right? So, for example, it used to be something called phobic neurosis. Now we know there are different types of phobias that are, that are quite different in a lot of different ways. I, I won't go into the details now, but part of it is subtyping, but part of it might be this expansion. So, for example, some of the new syndromes that have been embraced in the DSM are a stuttering. Is that a mental illness? I don't know. Um, Caffeine intoxication, oh, that'll pick up a lot of people, I tell you. Perhaps, especially those that are suffering from jet lag subtype of circadian rhythm disorder. <laughs> you know, you can't sleep, or you can't wake, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, but, and so, so, the, so uh, are we possibly blurring the boundary between distress and disorder? These are the some more, some more shall we say, exotic conditions are now recognized. But, but more, more generally, you know, where do we draw the line between shyness and social anxiety disorder, social phobia? They're kind of on a continuum in some sense. Where do we say, okay, this is no longer just a, oh, a harmless temperamental variation. Someone's shy, you know, okay. But when does it actually become social phobia, social anxiety disorder? Uh, or for that matter, sadness and depression. Or for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Most people exposed to ter horrific traumatic events experience post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, at least for days and weeks. Um, so where do we draw the line between a normal response to an abnormal stressor and a pathological condition? Uh, but in any event, so, so with all these controversies about the various DSM-3 through 4 and now through 5, um, it's still here. We have the new edition out, and some of these criticisms have even got more intense. But uh, in its defense, I want to play, you know, both sides of the, uh, the, the field here. One of the advantages uh, of these, since DSM-3 onward, is that finally uh, psychiatrists, <laughs> clinical psychologists, and epidemiologists had explicit diagnostic criteria. Um, what I mean is that people were being clear about the signs and symptoms of a condition that were requisite for making the diagnosis. And so well, this person has paranoid schizophrenia or this person has panic disorder with agoraphobia. Um, in the past, there were sort of these more impressionistic sort of descriptions, kind of qualitative um, impressionistic characterizations of what counted as a mental disorder. And that could make it difficult for two people, two clinicians to agree 
uh, they might interview the same patient and come out with, one would say manic depressive illness, one would say paranoid schizophrenia, and it's the same person. What's going on? So one of the advantages of having explicit diagnostic criteria is it tended, tended not always, but to increase diagnostic, diagnostic reliability. What that means, basically, is that if one patient describing the signs and symptoms, the things that are, the, uh, the troubles that they're having, um, and to two different clinicians, but if they're using the same criteria, they should converge on the same diagnosis. They should say, yep, this person has such and such condition. And when the criteria are explicit, at least you have a chance to achieve such agreement, which you ought to be able to do. So to give, you just a, a, uh, to give you just sort of an example of this, in DSM-2, before we had this sort of diagnostic revolution with explicit criteria, um, it was much more impressionistic. And when I was uh, first entered the, the field, actually as a, a psychiatric attendant nurse paying my way through college, uh, working full-time, going school part-time at, um, at Wayne State University in Detroit, and um, we were in, working under DSM-2 at the time, and uh, I only saw one patient on the locked unit with this disorder, but I'll give you an example of it. Um, this is the disorder called um, inadequate personality disorder. Now, you're probably you're wondering, you, know, you go to the doctor, you, ex you complain about different things, and you ask the doctor, what's my diagnosis? You say, you're, you're suffering from <laughs> inadequate personality. <laughs> but how do you say, oh, geez. <laughs> Worse yet. Worse yet, though, is when you try, well, well, get the description. Here, you open up the DSM. What the heck is it? What does this mean? Well, here it is. This behavior pattern is characterized by ineffectual responses to emotional, social, intellectual, and physical demands. While the patient seems neither physically nor mentally deficient, he does manifest inadaptability, ineptness, poor judgment, social instability, and lack of physical and emotional stamina. Whew. What the heck is that? I don't know. Uh, and, and so uh, when, it, when back in the 70s when they say psychiatrists can't, uh, you know, you, you, they can't agree on diagnoses, you wonder, you can see what the problem is when you're using such criteria. What in heaven's name would this be? So many of the syndromes were sort of re-specified and clarified with explicit criteria. This one, however, was consigned to the dustbin of history from which I extracted it from my talk tonight. This one under no condition is in there anymore. There is progress. Uh, uh, another good point in defense of the DSM, this controversial document that is still with us, uh, is that it did at least provide an atheoretical, relatively atheoretical lingua franca. So for example, one of the things about psychology and clinical psychology and psychiatry is that there are different perspectives. You have biological psychiatry, you have cognitive behavior therapy, you have uh, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, et cetera. All these people have a different sort of perspective on what causes or what may be the causes of mental disorders. But if you at least have a way of describing and diagnosing and talking about and discussing people with certain conditions, despite the differing perspectives on what's causing it, you can at least agree about what the problem is, okay? Uh, and so this is one of the aims that they had. Uh, Robert Spitzer, the head of the DSM-3, when he started this whole process, really transforming uh, uh, the whole field. So he, despite those theoretical differences about etiology, the causes, you can at least agree about what the person's suffering from. And this, in turn, greatly facilitated clinical research and basic research, epidemiological research. So for example, the epidemiologists who, who, who try to study the, um, the rates and in, 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 uh, risk factors for disease and disorders in the general population, they can train people to do these interviews, interview them in the population. We can estimate how common certain things are in the population precisely because of this. When you conduct studies for evidence-based psychotherapy or, or pharmacotherapy, you can at least agree that these people seem to have the same condition when you then uh, enter them into trials, testing, treatments, hoping some of them will, will help. Okay, so these are some of the, the issues of wh why the DSM is around. But as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the, the, our, some of our uh, social science colleagues are really sort of skeptical about whether we're really doing anything that's akin even remotely to what is done in other branches of, of medicine. Our dis mental disorders, they say, nothing but social constructions. The claim here, the suspicion here is that clinical scientists do not discover mental disorders as do scientists who discover infectious diseases, for example. Right? The idea here is that somehow we are 
inventing them. That there's kind of social constructions that, you know, biases and, 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 uh, of different social arrangements lead to people to stigmatize individuals and diagnose them with certain conditions. But one thing we have to keep in mind when dealing with this is that, of course, human beings, clinical scientists, psychopathologists, whatever, uh, they invent the concept, the diagnosis, but we must distinguish between constructing a concept, articulating the diagnostic criteria set, and the referent to which it refers, right? The disorder. So, I mean, the disorder usually is not shaped by these processes, even though the people shape the, the way of diagnosing it. Nevertheless, cognition does play a big role in mental disorders. You know, catastrophic beliefs in panic disorder, negative thinking and depression, delusions and schizophrenia, for example. And so, because in, in cognition, obviously, our thinking processes can surely be influenced by culture, so maybe it may play a role. I think one way of answering that social constructionist critique is to acknowledge that uh, culture does have an effect. It's not quite like finding, and it's not like infectious diseases in quite the same sense. Um, but culture tends to penetrate to varying degrees depending upon the condition that we're concerned with here. So, for example, sometimes culture barely touches the surface. So the content of delusions, you know, if you believe that the CIA has put a, some sort of a transmitter into your brain that's allowing your thoughts to escape into the air and people hear them, you have to know what the CIA is to have that delusion. So this is in a very trivial sense. You have culture influencing the content, although not necessarily the form of the delusion. Sometimes culture can shape the expression of the disorder, so it penetrates a little bit deeper so, for example, take panic disorder in the West. You know, folks who are troubled with panic disorder, uh, will, <clears throat> what will happen is that they will have these bodily sensations, maybe feeling dizzy, maybe their heart's skipping a beat, they feel a little lightheaded, and they think, oh my goodness, what's wrong with me? Am I possibly having a heart attack? Am I going to faint? Do I have a brain tumor? And, of course, that type of a fear tends to amplify the very sensations that provoke the thought. Right? So if you're afraid that you might have a heart attack, well, your heart will start beating, you might skipping beats, and, and so, and the sort of spiral tends to occur. This sort of goes upwards and culminating in a panic attack. So you have this sort of a catastrophic appraisal of these bodily sensations that can produce this spiral. That's kind of what presents in the West. Among Cambodians, for example, my colleague Devin Hinton, who is um, uh, an MD, PhD, um, or in the technical jargon, he's a, what's called a mud fud, <laughs> MD, PhD. Uh, the MD is, is in uh, medicine and psychiatry, and the FUD is in, the PhD is in anthropology. Uh, but we've, called, we've done some work, he's been the lead, lead, lead guy on this, on panic disorder among folks who have uh, fled Cambodia in the late 70s, early 80s, after the Pol Pot regime, a lot of post-traumatic stress from panic disorder. In the case of the Cambodians, you see the same sort of process between the bodily sensations this sort of misappraisal of what's happening, spiraling into panic. But the sensations are different. And so you see how the culture shapes them. They're not typically worried about their heart so much, but they'll, you know, they might stand up real quickly and experience orthostatic hypotension, you know, where, you're, where you get up quickly if you're on certain antidepressants, you feel lightheaded. Or uh, you might, they might feel a stiff neck, and they'll say, oh my God, I have cow gao which is wind blockade. So they believe that wind circulates through the circulatory system along with blood. And if they feel, say, a stiff neck, that frightens them. They say, oh, I've got wind blockade. My, my blood vessels are going to burst and I'm going to die. And so if you think you're about to die, what happens? You get more tense and so forth. The stiffness gets worse, et cetera, et cetera. But cry out to family members and say, coin me, coin me. Literally, you know, take a quarter and, and rub the area where the blockade presumably is until it goes away. And then it's, oh my God, whew, a close call. Okay, and, and so you see, here we get the same sort of a thing. We get some bodily sensations that occur that produces this appraisal which frightens the person, worsening those sensations. You get the same spiral, but, but they're different sensations. And so you see where the, 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 the focus of this is different from that in the West, but it's the same kind of process. Finally, you do get some conditions that seem to fit most closely to the, um, the social science critique about creating the disorders, such as multiple personality disorder. <laughs> 
also known today as dissociative identity. Sort of the name has changed, but the, the alleged processes are the same. The idea here is that a person is exposed to horrific traumatic events as a child, typically physical abuse, so, uh, sexual abuse, and th their mind kind of fractures and breaks out into different fragments. Originally whole personalities, presumably, but now it's just sort of fragments um, that sort of um, quarantine these traumatic memories in such a way that the person's conscious mind is unaware of them. But the, but they, the, the traumatic memories leak out into other symptoms. And the idea here is that you have to knit, to, you have to recover all these repressed tra or dissociated traumatic memories and process them. They go through all this terrible emotional upheaval, and then you reunite the, f the personality. That was the idea. Started actually with a, a case called Sybil. Some of you may remember this case from television or the books. It was a 1973 book about a woman who had over a dozen personalities. And to make a long story short, what it se seemed to have happened, you had a troubled client who was meeting up with a clinician, a therapist who was keen to find a case of multiple personality and with suggestive questioning and various medications, she came up with all these personalities. And the hist uh, Debbie Nathan is a historian, I guess you call it a historian, journalist of science who sort of uncovered the whole thing. It's sort of like a folie à deux where they almost co-created this phenomenon, but it created an epidemic of uh, multiple personality cases which has largely vanished today because of the controversies regarding the therapies designed to recover those memories, hypnotizing people and coming up with all these memories, some of, a lot of which were apparently not true. But here's a case where you get culture really penetrating it. Okay, now, now to shift gears from uh, the sort of social science end of things and psychopathology to the evolutionary uh, biology issues, is that um, like most human traits, uh, variation in genes is correlated with variation in um, temperament and personality and, and psychopathology liabilities. And so there seemed to be a little bit of an evolutionary paradox. And what this means is that you know, mental disorders are, are harmful, obviously, uh, and um, they're pretty common. And they're also heritable. They tend to run in families. And so uh, the obvious question is, is why has not natural selection eliminated the susceptibility alleles from the population? So if you've got, for example, certain... Um, uh, alleles uh, that lead people to have, uh, uh, say, for example, schizophrenia, where people often are socially isolated, they, they're less, like, less likely to have kids, for example, uh, or other conditions where people are at risk for suicide or starvation and anorexia and emotion, all kind and heart attacks. Um, and so the question here is, why is it natural selection eliminated those obviously problematic alleles? And also, why do mental disorders strike the young? You know, because uh, one of the puzzles the evolutionary uh, folks say was, well, you know, given that um, the, this, it, it's no surprise that people who are beyond childbearing age would um, possibly develop uh, neuropsychiatric and mental disorders. That's no, no surprise from an evolutionary perspective because they're, it's, it's, it's invisible to natural selection because they're not in childbearing age. So they've already lived long enough, and so, so that's not the issue. If they've had kids, they already had the kids. They've passed on those genes already. Now they're, they're well beyond those years, and so it's kind of invisible to selection. No great surprise. But what is surprising is so many mental disorders have their origin before the age of 14. Upwards of 50% of them sometimes. So what's going on? One, one suggestion that people once made is, well, is it possible that the, what we call disorders today in post-industrial civilization are actually adaptations? That is to say something that was shaped by evolution in virtue of its survival significance way back in the day when we were all hunter-gatherers. So for example, these, this is this mismatch theory. With, um, so, um, uh, whoops, uh, uh, you know, a common, uh, a common example of this is certain fears, uh, fears of snakes, fears of heights, right? Um, and, and they say, well, you know, this is kind of a, dis uh, on, on sort of a distribution of, of concern or fear. People vary in their degree of fear of snakes, but it's very common also with heights. And the idea here is that people who are totally oblivious to heights way back in the hunter-gatherer days, dancing on the edges of cliffs, uh, whatever, whatever it might be, they didn't survive. Their genes were already taken out, right? And so the people who did survive passed on the genes, or those who are a little more wary about heights. All right, uh, same thing for snakes. Uh, snakes were indeed a threat to, uh, actually, 
uh, humans and also our uh, non-human primate ancestors. Uh, and so, the, uh, although most snakes are not deadly to human beings, enough of them are to render this a potential adaptation. So there, there's some, there, there's some uh, uh, um, uh, merit to that view, at least at the extreme end. Uh, others have suggested, oh, how about something like schizophrenia? You know, wow, you know, people have delusions and things of this sort. Is it possible that in many societies for many centuries that uh, they might have served as the shamans, you know, that they were some inspired touch by God or something of that sort, when really we would say today they were, they were suffering from psychosis? Um, well, this was sort of an interesting idea. What is interesting today is that you'll find schizophrenia recognized, not necessarily by the names we would use, all over the world and distinguished from people who are medicine men and shamans and visionaries, et cetera, et cetera. So this doesn't seem to be the case, because even in the cultures in which supposedly these people might fit in, despite apparent psychosis, uh, they do not. Um, then there's others who suggest that maybe depression is an evolved adaptation. The idea of someone is depressed, you know, it forces them to focus in on problem solving, the sort of problems that cause, presumably, the, the, the depression they're having. It enables you to disengage from goals, perhaps. And even people have said, it enables you to conserve energy if you're not moving around so much. We're also not sleeping either, but that's another issue. But important here, and this one here, is that a capacity for a depressed mood is not the same thing as depression. There's more to depression than just having a lowered mood. So I think this is true with anxiety and with depression. A lot of the things that at their extreme ends can be clearly maladaptive but the minor variants are likely adaptations. So to say that emotions are adaptations, are adaptive, are functional for us in everyday life, does not require that disorders are two. So here's an interesting solution that's put forth by Keller and Miller uh, a few years ago about why the susceptibility alleles have not been selected out of the population. Their theory is a mouthful. Polygenic mutation selection balance theory. I memorized that one. Boy, uh, what they're saying here, to translate this into English, to cut right to the chase, is a very interesting idea. They point out that 55% of our protein coding genes are expressed in the brain, right? And which means that the mutational target size of the brain is huge. Mutations and quote errors and transcription there. And with, now with the behavior geneticists and, and uh, uh, genomic people studying mental disorders, they point out that there's, it's not like you've got a gene for schizophrenia or a gene for bipolar disorder or things of this sort, but there are a lot of common alleles, variants of genes. Um, I didn't define what that was here. Um, but um, of, of relatively small effect that likely contribute. So the, there's a lot of different things that's maybe going wrong that renders a person liable to these conditions. Now, the catch then, and we're, what Miller and Keller pointing out is that in view of the, uh, the amount of genes that are expressed in the brain and the rate of mutation, that the mutation rate is likely to outpace natural selection. So you can sort of, it's like figure sort of an arms race going on here. You've got, you got uh, quote unquote errors, so to speak. Uh, of course, when they work, that's the engine of evolution, but most mutations don't work. They cause problems, right? So you get the mutational rate, and then you've got natural selection trying to pull these genes out, you might say. You've got this arms race where the mutation rate is likely to outpace that of natural selection. And so you'll still find these things present in the gene pool. Susceptibility alleles then will likely uh, persist in many cases. And there's also, in some cases, of large alleles of very uncommon, relatively uncommon ones, rare ones of large effect. They also can play a role as well. Now, um, so now we've got all these different, uh, you know, perspectives, issues, and themes on how to conceptualize mental disorders. And uh, as I mentioned right at the very beginning, one of the, the main issues has been, can we draw a principled distinction between distress and disorder? Is it possible that given the diverse types of conditions that we see in the DSM, that there's some essence, there's some fundamental core that sets them apart, that justifies them as being classified as medical conditions, or reimbursable by medical insurance, covered by insurance, and treatable by people who are clinicians, medical or otherwise. Is there a principled method of drawing that distinction? Jerry Wakefield is the philosopher social worker that I mentioned earlier, and Jerry, he has um, uh, said that yes, there is an answer to this, 
that every true instant, uh, true, true instance of a disorder constitutes a harmful dysfunction, harmful dysfunction. And what he's saying here, instead of tilting his cap to the social constructionists that emphasize the social and cultural influences on mental disorders and the evolutionary folks as well, what he says is that disorder, including mental disorder, but he would generalize this to other, other medical disorders as well, but he's focusing on mental disorders. Mental disorder is a hybrid concept, a hybrid concept. It comprises a factual component, he says, that specifies what has gone wrong within an evolved psychobiological mechanism. So the idea here is that evolution has shaped us to function in certain ways that uh, when things go wrong, this is one component of a disorder. It's not, fun it's not working as it's quote unquote designed to work by evolution. And the second component is a social value one, and here's the nod to the social constructionist folks. The social value sp component specifies the resultant harms for the person. So, if there is something that is not functioning as evolution designed it, quote unquote, to function as, and it's causing harm for the person in a variety of ways, then that constitutes a disorder. So there are a lot of different things that are harms that cause suffering and things of this sort that don't arise from a derangement in a psychobiological function of the mind. Those aren't disorders. I'll get to some examples here. Now, okay, so uh, if we say something is a dysfunction, that implies an unfulfilled function, right? There's a function, it's not working, so what's that function? Um, what he's arguing here is it, it's the, a derangement in a natural function. And what biologists, evolutionary biologists, refer to as the natural function of some organ uh, that um, uh, is, is the, the function that was selected for evolution that explains why it's present today in the general population. Um, so for example, the natural function of the heart is, well, pumping blood. Right, the reason why we have hearts is, well, they pump blood, and et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole evolutionary story behind that. So natural selection then, favored aspects of our phenotype that fostered reproductive success in ancestral populations. So things that promoted our survival in order for us to reproduce and passing on our genes, et cetera, et cetera. That's, so it's those functions. When those go awry, now we're, and they cause harm, you've got a disorder on your hand. So natural selection, he's appealing now to the evolutionary folks, underlies functional ascription, and hence the concept of disorder. So you've got to identify the natural function before you're entitled to claim that person is suffering from a disorder. The harm component, well, personal suffering, that's an obvious one. Increased mortality risk if it's shortening your life, an inability to work, to you know, survive, support oneself, uh, uh, interpersonal um, problems, you know, Aristotle said we are a social animal, and you know, if you're unable to connect with your peers, that's clearly a harm. A risk of loss of freedom, that's in other words of saying doing something that gets you in jail, right? So that covers the sociopaths who may be cheerfully committing all sorts of mischief, and, um, but paying for it, the harm comes when they lose, lose their freedom, etc. So what he's trying to do here with this, the harmful dysfunction also, the HDA, is to settle the border disputes, the boundary problem that, that we mentioned at the beginning to identify the genuine disorders and segregate them, separate them from ordinary suffering. And what he, the way he likes to put it is to rule out the false positives, conditions that are normal because there's no derangement in an evolutionary psychobiological function that are distressing, the person's suffering, but they're not actually disorders. So there's some successful examples of this. I mentioned panic disorder earlier. Uh, Don Klein, an eminent psychiatrist, postulated, for example, that panic attacks arise from a derangement in sort of a postulated suffocation alarm system. Don pointed out that many people, when they first begin to have a panic attack, um, they will feel dizzy and they'll have dyspnea, they have difficulty bleed, uh, bleed, uh, difficulty speaking, difficulty breathing. And so, so they're, they're, they're you know, getting air hunger like this. So it's, they feel as if they're suffocating. What he postulated is that uh, we have to detect rising levels of carbon dioxide, the lack of ambient oxygen, or we die. 
right? Uh, and, and so all mammals need to do this. And so we, we obviously had to have evolved such a, a system for detecting this type of threat, a suffocation threat, a suffocation alarm system. But what he postulates is that where the dysfunction is, is that the threshold for setting off the alarm is set too low. So in other words, a person is getting signals of suffocation when they're not actually suffocating. Now, carbon dioxide in the blood and through the brain is at a certain level, but it's um, in a normally functioning system, it wouldn't trigger this alarm. Because once the person uh, gets the alarm, they start gasping for air and they get a full-blown panic attack. This is the point he's making. So it's kind of like a smoke detector. You know, occasionally people will uh, have the smoke detectors in the home that will go off when somebody burns the toast or something like that. It's like that, you know. Um, that's exactly what he's talking about. So the person's having a panic attack when the carbon dioxide levels are maybe rising, but they are not actually, the threshold for firing the alarm is too low. So there's clearly, there's, there's your, there's your uh, harmful dysfunction. Fits perfectly the Wakefieldian analysis. But it's not all just biology. David Clark, an eminent uh, a British psychologist, pointed out that you know, this, the real dysfunction is, is uh, one in the um, detection of threat, a, 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 a tendency to misinterpret catastrophically bodily sensations. So if you misinterpret dizziness as a brain tumor or, or, or palpitations as a heart attack, um, that's the dysfunction. That's what sets you off. Everything else makes sense. If you think you're actually dying, no wonder you're afraid and your heart beats faster. No surprise there. The problem is the, the antecedent misappraisal. So there's the dysfunction, but it's in the computation of threat. So it's about a cognitive law. All of these fit. Um, and some of the ones that get excluded is, for example, grief reaction. Someone who loses a loved one. Spousal bereavement, we've studied that in our, our group as well. And you know, someone's married for 40 years and the spouse suddenly dies. Uh, it's very, very common to have grief reactions that look like depression. But here, is this really a disease, a disorder? Or is this the normal reaction of disengagement, a, a thing that involved? This is how we're supposed to, quote, unquote, function. Uh, as, 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 a, as selected by evolution, so to speak, or conduct disorder, kids who get into trouble, uh, for example, running away from home, lying, breaking curfew, and things of that sort. But suppose, suppose you have a kid who's being sexually abused or physically abused at home. Um, Huckleberry Finn, right? You know, his dad was, you know, a, a bad guy, alcoholic, violent, so far. He takes off, right? Lights out for the country. I mean, Huckleberry Finn would have conduct disorder. But is there anything actually wrong with him in any fundamental sense? You know, kids can qualify for this if their mechanisms of impulse control, empathy, and conscience are functioning fine. You know, in fact, that's the interesting thing about Mark Twain's novel. When, when uh, um, Jim and, and, Huck, and Huck are going down the river, and they're lighting out and so forth, and all these, function, all these things that are supposedly disarranged are working just fine in Huck Finn, despite of the behavioral things that are more tied to his environment. So Wakefield points a conduct disorder blurs this thing. So this one, unlike the panic disorder examples, don't fit very well. Nevertheless, there's still some problems with the harmful dysfunction analysis. The biggest one, unfortunately, and, and, and Jerry Wakefield is a philosopher here and a social worker, not an evolutionary biologist, difficulties identifying the natural functions. You always hear the philosophers always bring up the heart and pump and blood. Okay, that's an easy one, guys. But, but how about the mechanisms governing morality or conscience or these? It's a lot more complicated. And it's partly because we have no fossil record for cognition really don't have a fossil record. So in anatomy and uh, evolutionary biology, so you, you've got fossils and you can, you can uh, it's a huge help in sort of reconstructing an evolutionary past of certain organisms. And also people say, well, gosh, you know, why should evolutionary history uh, possess privileged status today for, dis for defining disorders? Why should this concept of a function the natural function is selected by evolutionary history. Why should that be the one? After all, we're not in the hunter-gatherer stage now, huh? And another problem is that Jerry points out that, uh, that the function is purely factual. Factual, just describing something without taking sides. It, it's not normative, right? But actually, the, the, the notion of function 
and we, we published debates about that, he and I. Turned out his advisor agrees with me, his PhD advisor, when I found that out. I thought that was good. <laughs> he didn't lose his PhD, though. It wasn't revoked because of that. But, um, to say that a mechanism is dysfunctional is to say that it's not functioning as it ought to function. And ought statements are normative, right? So, by definition. So it's built right into that. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, Wakefield would say that, for example, homosexuality, uh, sexual orientation, ver ver variants of sexual orientation, um, uh, by his theory, uh, is H. Day would say, well, they're dysfunctional in the sense that they're not, you know, involved in reproductive success and da da da. But if the person uh, is doing just fine and they have no issues, that it's not a disorder because it's not harmful, you know. It's just, uh, but I, I, the, when, when the, he denies that function is not really normative, it's merely factual, it's sort of like saying, well, you know, um, I've got good news and bad news. Uh, uh, you, you would have to, have to say, he said, uh, speaking to a gay person, well, you have a dysfunction, but you don't have a disorder. You know? Yeah, it just, it's, it's, it sounds, uh, the reason why it sounds so peculiar and, and really quite, uh, um, you know, quite negative is that they're actually, they're both normative. So the dysfunction goes beyond just merely a difference. I mean, there's a normative judgment about that built into it. But when do differences become dysfunctions or deficits? Well, only when the difference has adverse consequences for the person. And now we have to appeal to the harm to adjudicate the function. And we're getting caught into a circle, unfortunately. And then, but then functions and dysfunctions rest on the harms they produce. And so we're trapped in kind of a tautological trap here. We also, and also this leads to some really paradoxical treatment implications. So, so you know, if he puts on his social worker hat, takes off his philosopher hat, uh, um, well, you can say, well, okay, who should be treated? The whole point in adjudicating distress and disorders, not the whole point, but a major one, is to say what ought to be in a manual of mental disorders that warrant compensable, re reimbursable treatment intervention, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who should be treated? Um, so, for, for, uh, you know, for post-traumatic stress disorder, I mean, uh, if this, is this a normal response to an abnormal stressor? I mean, when does it become tr treatable? It's clearly harmful, no question about that. And depression. I mean, so for example, you might have somebody who is, uh, suppose someone who's, who's uh, uh, encountering uh, a terrible psychosocial stressors, loses a job, husband dies, the, uh, uh, they're impoverished, et cetera, et cetera, and they develop depression. So are we going to follow the HDA and say, well, let's see here. Um, you're clearly, the harm thing is, you're, you're, you're clearly having depression, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of the harms being produced. On the other hand, your psychobiological mechanisms to loss and threat are working just fine, so it doesn't see any dysfunction. So, sorry, you don't have a disorder, we can't treat you. So we get these, so we have this paradox is built in here. Or if someone, for example, uh, develops uh, depression after getting a cancer diagnosis, so, well, gosh, a little surprise that you do. But uh, Ken Kendler, a psychiatrist who's also a debated Jerry on some of these matters, has pointed out that when I've treated m patients with antidepressants and they have cancer, they, well, their depression gets better. So it's, it's not, not necessarily an automatic consequence. If someone wanted to go this far, you could at least put through, a, a, I guess, a revised HDA here. You could talk, I suppose, about disorders, harmful dysfunction, and the current causal role of a psychobiological mechanism. If you did want to follow this route, you could let's say, let's move the evolutionary criterion out of the picture. Why rely on evolutionary standards, speculation, which is what it really is, since we have no fossil record, etc. Um, so, for example, William Harvey, he didn't, he didn't know anything about evolution when he elucidated the function of the circulatory system. He knew nothing about it, right? But he got it right. He basically, he nailed it. And so really, uh, one could say that if you wanted to go this route, make it on current causal function. Where here you can actually, uh, physiologists really can understand these things. Okay, finally, what I want to do now is to wrap things up here with um, um, the um, network approach to psychopathology. Which is a, a very, very different, uh, different than the ones we've been discussing so far. Uh, Danny Boersboom is a psychometrician, so he, th this means he's a math guy who likes psychology issues. He's not a clinical psychologist, etc. Et University of Amsterdam. 
And uh, uh, he's been the, the real prime driver behind this, uh, which has now spread. Uh, uh, myself and my PhD students took the virus from um, Amsterdam, and now it's gone, through, gone viral in the United States and elsewhere, too. So a lot of work going on in this, this area. But, it, but it, attempts, it attempts to address, uh, at the outset, um, some, a common observation about symptoms of psychopathology. They do not co-occur randomly. Everybody agrees with that, right? So for example, it's much more likely that compulsions will be associated with obsessions in people who meet the full cluster of criteria for obsessive compulsive disorder, um, and people with auditory, full auditory hallucinations often have delusions more often than people with OCD, et cetera, et cetera. So they kind of hang together. They kind of, as we say, you know, they co-occur. They tend to cohere, cohere syndromically. So in other words, they come in clusters, syndromes. A syndrome is just simply a cluster of signs and symptoms that are occurring a lot. Um, it, we don't know uh, what the cause of that might be, but they tend to hang together. Everybody agrees with that. The question is why? Why does that happen, okay? Now, the received view, the standard view that we've had, myself included, <laughs> um, for many, many years is that they, well, because they share a common cause, right? They share a common cause. That's why these things cluster, namely the underlying disorder. The idea here then, on this very common perspective, is that symptoms are reflective of the latent entity that produces their uh, emergence and co-occurrence. By latent ent entity, all I mean by that, and I'll give some examples to clarify, uh, is that th there's something in the psychobiology of the person, there's some sort of a disease entity, some sort of an underlying cause. It's latent only in the sense that we have not yet um, uh, I've observed it. It's not in principle unobservable. We just haven't observed it. What we do see are sort of the results, the consequences of that. And this is true whether you see it as a categorical discrete thing, such as a lung tumor, for example, or a dimensional thing, such as problems with, uh, that lead to hypertension. Now, here's a, here is a, 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 um, a figure here. I, I'm not sure how well you can see this here from uh, Boris Boom and Angelique Kramer, his uh, grad student's uh, article. Uh, you see major depression here is the, the sort of latent cause. And, it, and, and the things that indicate it's, um, it's uh, where is that darn thing? Is that, the, is that it? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so depressed mood, loss of interest, weight change, sleep disturbance, psychomotor retardation, fatigue, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, you know, suicidality, uh, whoops. And so all of these, these symptoms here, you notice um, all the lines go back, to, come out of major depressive disorder. This is the underlying condition uh, that is the common cause. So you treat the underlying condition and then all of these will go away. Whoops, I'm pointing at, all of these will <laughs> go away. So all the lines are coming straight down. Okay. Okay, so the key assumptions then uh, that we've been operating under for all these years is that the underlying entity, the disease, disorder, whatever you want to call it, is the cause of the symptoms that reflect its presence. Now, the, that means the disorder is distinct from its symptoms, okay? And what this rests on is uh, the axiom of local independence. And I don't know how many patients I've interviewed over the decades. I never sat there and wondered, are the symptoms that this patient has just mentioned to me? Do they satisfy the axiom of local independence? Yeah, is, is that something that has troubled my sleep very often or that of the other clinical psychologists and psychiatrists? The axiom of local independence. This is where the psychometricians, these math dudes who come into our field really help us out a little bit. Um, what this means, uh, uh, this axiom translated into English, is simply that symptoms are functionally unrelated. They're not actually causally related once we conditionalize on the presence of the latent common cause. Now, for example, so suppose I were to um, bring a six th thermometers into this room, okay? Uh, and after a few minutes, I go around the room and I look at the mercury uh, levels, the re how it registers uh, on the glass of the thermometer. So 72 degrees, 72, 70, wow. They all say 72 degrees. What a coincidence. Oh, that's amazing. Um, none of you are surprised. Um, uh, and uh, because there's a latent common cause, obviously the temperature in the room, there's a whole story about the kinetic energy and the molecules, da da da, making the mercury rise in the tubes. But you know, that, that's it, right? So for, to prove that, I take a thermometer, uh, one of the thermometers, I put an ice cube on it, and shoo, the mercury drops. But it does not affect the mercury levels on all the other thermometers. If it did, that would really be weird. 
but it doesn't. Okay, so these are locally independent, right? So I manipulate one, has no effect on the others. Um, we, I, we have this sort of case with certain medical conditions, and this is why psychiatry has sort of slid into thinking about this common cause sort of a model. Consider strep throat, right? So someone is having pain upon swallowing and um, running of a fever, maybe 102, 103 maybe, uh, a very sore throat, they have fatigue, and they got little white blotches in the throat that can be spotted. Uh, if you're looking in the mirror, you see all this stuff. And the doctor goes, oh boy, it looks like strep throat. And then that could be independently uh, you know, confirmed, right? You can d distinguish the pre presence of the streptococcus bacteria uh, from, say, a virus, and that makes a huge difference, right? If it's strep throat, you boom, you hit that common cause with antibiotics, and lo and behold, all of these symptoms go away, right? So as you get something like this, it tends to be more that fit that sort of common cause model, satisfying a lo local independence for the most part. But is that plausible for psychopathology? We seem to have a failure of the axiom of local independence. As any clinician will tell you, you know, this idea is crazy. I mean, there's no connections, no functional relations, no causal relations among symptoms at all. I mean, consider depression, for example. Someone is ruminating, right? They have a hard time falling asleep at night. They have insomnia. And guess what? The next morning they're tired, they're fatigued. Any surprise? No. These are functionally, they're connected. They're causally connected. That may also impair their concentration at work. You can see these things. Or bulimia nervosa. You have a fear of becoming fat. So you've restrained eating. You're not eating enough, right? You're trying to get through the day on a little salad or something. You're really hungry at night. And then you raid the fridge. And you have a binge eating, you know, consuming a lot of bread or ice cream or whatever. And they say, oh my goodness, what did I do? You get very distressed. And then you throw, make yourself throw up and purge feeling that that might you know, help uh, reduce the likelihood of becoming fat. It's clear for these, so many of our conditions are like this. Obsessive compulsive patients who get obsessions, they get really distressed when they wash or check the uh, uh, the, in response to the obsessions, engaging in this compulsive behavior, they, they feel better, at least in the short run. So symptoms seem to be causally interconnected, not independent of one another. Moreover, the disorder is not distinct from its indicators, right? <clears throat> So, for example, uh, how many times have you know someone had you know had some problems with uh, you ha went to the doctors and uh, they do a standard chest X-ray and they detect a spot on the lung and it turns out to be a, a lung tumor and the person is as of yet still asymptomatic, right? So, so you can have a silent tumor that's unrecognized, um, but you can, but it, that doesn't really make sense for. For most of our conditions, one uh, where we have a, a common cause, trisomy 21 and Down syndrome will be an example of a common cause. The features associated with this, uh, with this syndrome, uh, um, you know, m mental retardation and, and uh, the thick tongue and so on and so forth, the short stature, there's a whole bunch of clusters of, of signs and, and also symptoms that are the common cause of having three copies of chromosome 21. That's one of the rare examples in our field. Okay, so the alternative to this, <clears throat> is that symptoms under the network view are not fallible indicators of a latent underlying category or dimension. Rather, the symptoms constitute a network of functionally related in elements. So the episode of mental disorder is the activation of a causal network. Uh, the, the network comprises nodes. It's like a little tinker toys, like circles and lines, nodes, usually symptoms, and edges, the lines connecting them, connections between them. Um, and the thickness of the association, the strength of these, the likelihood of co-occurrence corresponds to the, um, uh, you know, the, the correlation, the partial correlation. I don't want to go too much into the, the weeds here, but the, the how strong they're connected, more likely to co-occur together, is the thickness of the lines. I'll give you a couple of examples. Now, one of the interesting things about network analysis is it, 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 it produces net, uh, metrics of what is called node centrality, or the in our field, psychopathology, the importance of a symptom. So, uh, uh, strength centrality, what this refers to, so you, you imagine, visualize this, and I'll show some examples shortly. Uh, you have the node, and if it's got a lot of edges connected to it, okay, um, the, the, the strength of that is the number of connections uh, 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 you know, multiply, multiplied by their, their, their weights, how strong they are. So the more likely this symptom gets activated, the more likely it's gonna activate other symptoms. Okay. Um, now, 
the highly central symptoms, the ones that are important in the likelihood that should they be activated are more likely to be associated with activation of others, is very, very different from the hallmark, notion of hallmark symptoms of a disorder. Um, and, um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, when I was, uh, I was on the DSM-4 uh, committee, a couple of them with phobia and PTSD, and, and one of the things that we were trying to do in a lot of these committees was to identify the hallmark symptoms of certain disorders. That is to say, certain sim signs or symptoms that were strongly associated with one cluster, but not so much with others, like emotional numbing and post-traumatic stress disorder and flashbacks is a good example. Obviously, um, making yourself throw up after eating, uh, uh, certainly with bulimia nervosa, hallmark symptoms, okay? Ones that are, you rarely see in other sort of conditions. Now, the central symptoms are, are really quite different from that. They're the ones with a lot of different connections. Sometimes in the analyses that have been done in this area, they are the same, like anhedonia and sadness and depression, but not always. Okay, I'm just gonna just give a quick example to close with here. This is an early study that we did with um, earthquake survivors published uh, a few years ago. Uh, we had, um, this is from the Wenchan earthquake. This is a collaboration between my group, uh, Li Wang's in uh, Be uh, Institute of Psychology, Beijing, and Danny Borsboom's group in Amsterdam. And these are survivors of uh, this terrible earthquake, and um, uh, each of whom had lost at least one child in the earthquake. A third, a third of them were rubble survivors. They were also injured as well. And we, at about a third of them had post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of people, the, the symptoms varied widely. Um, and um, what we get here, uh, this is just a very simple association network. And, and we get here, you see a lot of different connections. Some of these are kind of obvious and known, well known to clinical uh, observation, avoiding activities that remind you of the traumatic event, this, the earthquake in this case, and avoiding thoughts, trying not to think or talk about that. They're obviously strongly connected, et cetera, and uh, flashbacks of the trauma are strongly related to dreams, nightmares of the traumatic event. Those are, you know, again, not surprising. And then we, uh, then we uh, uh, in the next slide here, this is a, um, a graphical last. So th this is a what's called a regularized partial correlation network. In translated in English, what that means is that you are computing the association for symptoms, c adjusting statistically for the influence of all others. So you're really getting a, a direct connection, right, once you're adjusting for, for the others. And when the dust settles, so these are the direct connections that sort of um, arise. Some of these, again, are, are whoops, um, some of these are, are not particularly surprising, uh, you know, physio uh, being, uh, getting physiological reactions when you encounter a reminder of the trauma and getting, well, psychologically upset at the same time. That's no surprise. On the other hand, the network analysis can also reveal different edges that are not obvious, such as sleep disturbance and anger, uh, rage and irritability and startle, things of this sort. Uh, uh, other types of networks, relative important networks, can identify different looping relations between the symptoms and so forth. So, um, uh, so, so just to summarize here, I just wanted to give just a, a quick illustration of this. But the basic idea here then is that uh, with what the network analysis is trying to do is trying to look at mental disorders as systems of interacting components rather than mere passive reflections of an underlying common cause. So it's not like Down syndrome, trisomy 21. It's not like strep throat. It's not like a lung tumor that produces these sort of things. And this has huge implications because the common cause model says that the way you treat these things is you get at the common cause and you treat it. You remove the lung tumor. Right? You, you can't change trisomy 21, unfortunately, that, that obviously is, that doesn't work. Um, but you, you give a, a, um, penicillin or oxicillin to kill the bacteria when you treat strep throat. You don't say, oh, just take some aspirin. Your headache may go away or your fever may go down a little bit, but it's not going to get at it. Network by analysis says that there's no single common cause. So what you want to do, rather, is to identify those symptoms that are most likely to be causing the trouble and targeting those sorts of symptoms to turn, off the, turn down the volume of them, to weaken the, the, the spread of activation to other symptoms. Uh, in some cases, you're actually directly severing the edges between them. So, for example, some people with panic disorder, when they get their heart beating fast, they start thinking, oh, I'm having a heart attack. Most of us don't. 
right? So there's certain edges that are present in these folks that can be severed through cognitive therapy. So that doesn't happen any longer. That's what you do. You're not treating some underlying condition. Now, Don Klein would disagree. He says you need to increase the threshold for firing of the theoretical suffocation alarm. That's a different theory, right? With medication, and that should cure everything, right? Uh, that's a common cause model, very different one. So the point here is that the network analysis provides a different way of looking at these things rather than searching for a single underlying cause. I believe I am need to finish up right now. So thank you very much for your attention.